Uh, I make it 7.30 uh, UK time, so uh, we'll begin. Um, so welcome uh, to all of you. Uh, there seems to be quite a strong representation from the United States, so particular welcome to all of you. Um, and welcome to this series of lectures, um, mm. those of you on Zoom, those of you here in person. Um, so these lectures are under the auspices of the Edward King Center at St. Stephen's House. Edward King was the principal founder of St. Stephen's House and uh, um, was, before he became Bishop of Lincoln, was the uh, professor of partial theology at the University of Oxford. And so the Edward King Center, uh, the uh, aim of this really is to provide uh, theological formation, education to perhaps a wider audience than would ordinarily um, have access to it through St. Stephen's House. So we're delighted to offer these uh, free lectures. Um, you're not required to attend all of them. Um, attend the ones that you can. They're also being recorded and you can request a recording um, afterwards through the Edward King Centre email. No, no it's not. Okay, so uh, Amy, if you would like to do the business, um, can I ask you for the moment to mute your uh, devices um, and then have an opportunity uh, towards the end. Um, so I hope to speak for about uh, 45 minutes and then there'll be some time for questions, uh, comments, um, chance to look at some of the paintings again. Uh, so the primary aim of this course of lectures is to think about Advent and Christmas, particularly through the lens of visual artists. So uh, how visual artists have functioned, often as quite sophisticated interpreters of the Bible. Um, uh, can you all see the image on the screen? You can. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, that's the first bit of technology working. Uh, okay, so uh, I call this series the Empty Narratives Through Five Paintings. Now you will see um, as we progress that I'm not restricting myself to five paintings, um, but there's always going to be one painting each week that uh, provides a kind of peg. Uh, on which to hang our exploration of the infancy narratives of Matthew and Luke. And today's painting, um, which some of you may know, it's in the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., um, I've chosen to illustrate the genealogy of Christ. And you might think this is a rather unusual representation of the genealogy. I, I think oh. I have to unplug it and plug it back. Mute audio. Uh, okay, so um, so this is uh, the nativity with the infant St. John. Um, it's uh, a tondo from the Latin, uh, from the, the Italian uh, rotondo. It's a circular painting, um, which was probably designed for private devotion, either in a palace or perhaps for public display in a municipal building. Um, and it's by uh, Piero di Cosimo. It's one of his favorite modes of painting was the tondo. Um, uh, Piero di Cosimo, um, that's not his family name. He's called Piero di Cosimo because he was taught by uh, the artist Cosimo Rosselli. In fact, he uh, assisted Rosselli in his fresco for the Sistine Chapel in Rome, um, but de Cosimo was primarily active in Florence uh, in the late 15th and early 16th century. Um, he was a rather eccentric artist. Um, so he's mentioned by Vasari in his Lives of the Artists. Apparently he was terrified of thunderstorms. Uh, he had a great fear of fire, which is why he hardly ever cooked for himself. He lived on a diet of boiled eggs. 
He'd boiled them 50 at a time when he was boiling up uh, glue for his uh, artistic work. Um, and he never cleaned his studio. But he produced some magnificent uh, works of art. Um, so it's circular, therefore it's symbolizing uh, eternity or harmony uh, within the cosmos. But as I say, you might think it's a rather strange painting to choose to illustrate the genealogy of Jesus. You might be expecting perhaps a more familiar Jesse tree. You know those uh, stained glass windows often found in French cathedrals. We'll look at one of those uh, in uh, a little while. Um, but this isn't an obvious painting to choose for the genealogy. But bear with me, there is logic in my madness. Um, but even as a nativity scene, it is not particularly typical. Um, it's a family portrait, um, an ex extended family portrait, because it includes not only uh, Christ and his mother, but also the infant John the Baptist. Um, and of course, according to Luke's gospel, John was one of the extended family, um, which is why he fits in this uh, family group. But that's Luke. And our attention is not on Luke, but on Matthew's genealogy, um, which traces the family tree upwards, uh, sorry, downwards. In Luke, it traces upwards to Adam, uh, linking Christ with the whole of humanity. Um, in Matthew, it traces the family tree downwards from Abraham through David um, to the coming of the Christ, and it's introduced by what seems to be a title for Matthew's Gospel. It parallels the title of Mark's Gospel, uh, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. In Matthew, uh, the book, normally translated the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, son of David, son of Abraham. Uh, book of genealogy is probably misleading, something more like the book of the origin of Jesus Christ, son of David, son of Abraham, or literally the book of Genesis, Biblos Genesius. Uh, so tracing Christ's ancestry from Abraham through David and via trauma. So at the heart of the genealogy, there is the trauma of war and deportation, exile. Um, deportation to Babylon. Anyway, I've chosen this not because of the figures at the centre, but rather this figure at the top, uh, a rather decrepit Joseph. Um, he's overshadowed by the other characters, and he is very gingerly descending a step. Um, how does this help understand Matthew's genealogy? Well, of course, um, for the first Christian millennium, actually the first Christian millennium and a half, the elderly Joseph was typical. And it goes back to a second century text, the Proto-Evangelium of James, um, which is a, an early infancy gospel. Um, uh, and it remains the view of Joseph right through into the Middle Ages and beyond. So you, some of you may know the uh, medieval uh, cherry tree carol. Joseph was an old man, and an old man was he. He married sweet Mary, the Queen of Galilee. Um, so, um, originally, in the Proto-Evangelium, the elderly Joseph seems to be there to promote belief in the perpetual virginity <coughs> of Mary. So we have uh, the story of <coughs> Mary, she's brought up uh, in the temple. She reaches the age when she can no longer remain in the temple. Um, and Joseph emerges as a, a very elderly and rather reluctant suitor, someone to protect Mary, to bring her into his house when she has to leave the temple. Uh, and this motif of the elderly Joseph gets elaborated in apocryphal gospels. So in the gospel of Pseudo-Matthew, not the canonical Matthew, um, probably 7th, 8th century, 
Um, Joseph is already a grandfather when he is betrothed to Mary, and his grandchildren are older than Mary. Um, in the Coptic history of Joseph the Carpenter, Joseph was 90 at the time that he uh, it was betrothed to Mary. So the elderly Joseph is a very ancient motif. But by the time that Piero di Cosimo is painting uh, Joseph, another feature of Joseph's great age seems to be dominant. And that is Joseph is presented as an old man because he is the last of the Old Testament patriarchs. Um, he stands at the transition between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And, and this kind of debate, you know, is Joseph a Christian saint? Or does he belong to the Old Covenant? And, and there was not a universal thesis on Joseph until 16th century. Uh, in the West, anyway. Um, so, um, there are various traditions about how old Joseph was when he died. Uh, in the Coptic history of Joseph the Carpenter, he is only 111. Uh, in other traditions, he is 120, which is the same age as Moses when he died. And in some, he is 200, which is 25 years older than Abraham. So, this idea that he is modeled in some sense on the patriarchs of the old covenant seems to be, have uh, added something to this idea of Joseph as the elderly figure. Okay, we'll come back to this uh, in a little while, but uh, I want now to take us to Matthew's genealogy and look at its shape because, as many of you will know, it's a very stylized genealogy. Um, it structures the family tree into three groups, uh, three sets of 14 generations. Um, except, as many of the early fathers of the church recognized, there aren't actually 14 generations in the third set. Uh, you have to count somebody twice in order to get uh, 14 rather than 13, but this number 14, three sets of 14 generations, is immensely significant, 42 generations in total. And the structure, this threefold structure, wraps around <clears throat> the low points and the high points of salvation history. Um, so it begins with an old man and an old woman, Abraham and Sarah, and an implausible promise that this elderly couple would not only have a child, but would be the ancestors of a great nation. So that's where it starts with Abraham. Uh, and the first big climax is not only with the emergence of a people as descendants of this elderly couple, but the glorious in some ways, glorious reign of King David, which for many was the kind of pinnacle of the monarchy in Israel. The second group then um, brings us from the heights to the depths. So we end, we begin with the glorious reign of David, and we end with the apparent demise of the Davidic monarchy with war, with destruction and the deportation to Babylon. Um, and then the third set of 14, 13, 14 generations brings a story from despair, the restoration and salvation from the Babylonian exile to the birth of the Messiah, who is the son of David, thus restoring what had been lost. So it's a very stylized, schematized uh, genealogy. Um, and Matthew is very keen that his readers or his audiences pay close attention to the number 14, um, which he repeats, in case we missed it the first time around, he repeats it right at the end of the genealogy in verse 17. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations, and from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations, and from the deportation to Babylon to the Messiah, 
we get the point, 14 generations. Uh, and almost certainly what's going on here is the use of uh, gematria that is uh, correlating the, the letters of somebody's name with their numerical value. Um, and in the Hebrew alphabet, the name David, 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 David uh, is four plus six plus four equals 14. So clearly playing with numbers here. So we might translate verse 17 somewhat differently. Uh, so all the generations from Abraham to David are David generations. And from David, the deportation of Babylon, David's generations, and from the deportation to Babylon to the Messiah, David's generations. Okay, now, so let's come back to the to Joseph um, in Pierre de Cosimus Tondo. Um, Matthew's Gospel, of course, says nothing about Joseph's age, although the normal expectation would be that he would have been only slightly older than Mary. Um, but Matthew does, in his characterization of Joseph, both show and tell us something fundamental about Joseph's character. Um, so, is Dechaios. He is just or righteous, and in Matthew, righteousness often seems to be associated with obedience to the law, um, and his actions actually demonstrate his utter obedience. The angel appears to him in a dream, the angel instructs, and he follows the instruction to the letter. Um, he never says a word in the whole of the narrative, but he does a lot, and he does what he's taught to do. So it's a very obedient uh, Joseph um, uh, A model of obedience, which then prepares for the depiction of Christ in the Gospel of Matthew, obedient to the Father's will. Um, but he doesn't say anything. But he does sleep a lot. Um, it's kind of very striking that almost every time that Joseph is mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew, he is asleep. Um, and uh, I've often wondered why St. Joseph is a patron saint of students. <laughs> and then suddenly clicked when I was a student myself. Um, <laughs> but uh, um, <laughs> Joseph the Dreamer uh, is not an appropriate uh, patron for um, students uh, and tutors as well. Okay. Um, but most importantly, in Matthew's genealogy, he comes in the penultimate place in. The list. Um, which brings us back to this idea of the elderly Joseph as the last of the patriarchs and the crucial link in the chain between the royal line of David and Jesus, the new son of David. He even gives Jesus his name in Matthew's uh, narrative and therefore brings him into the royal family tree. So he's there right almost at the climax of this genealogy, a story which begins with promise, fulfillment, dash hopes, and restoration. He is the crucial last step in this uh, genealogy. And so in Piero's painting, he stands at the top of the circuit, but now he's coming down. Um, because his role as providing Davidic descent has now been fulfilled. He's done his job, he's handed it over, he can now descend. Um, and um, he's descending a staircase uh, which doesn't look particularly stable because it's part of a ruined building. Um, so there's something else going on here. Um, and for this, we need to bring in an Old Testament prophecy that Matthew doesn't actually quote, but it is quoted in the Acts of the Apostles. Um, it's a prophecy from uh, the prophet Amos, uh, which is cited by James in the so-called Council of Jerusalem in Acts 15, 
Uh, but it's a text which will become immensely important in uh, the Middle Ages and the Renaissance in reflection upon the person of David. Uh, and Amos 9-11. On that day, I will raise up the booth of David that is fallen, and repair its breaches, and raise up its ruins, and rebuild it as in the days of old. So the house of David is crumbling, and it is now being built up. It is now being repaired. It is now being raised. Perhaps a even more striking example of this is this panel from uh, uh, an altarpiece by Master Bertram of Hamburg. Um, he has a number of altarpieces. There's a wonderful one in the V&A in London, um, which is an apocalypse uh, altarpiece. Multiple scenes from the Book of Revelation there. Um, but here you'll notice uh, at least two things. Well, three things. First of all, you've got the laughing donkey. Um, secondly, you've got Joseph handing over the child to Mary. He is giving her the child whose Davidic descent he has bestowed upon. Um, and the other thing is that he is propping up this crumbling shack with his shoulder. This is the fallen house of David, which is now being restored with the birth of Christ. It's a very, very pervasive image associated with Joseph um, in uh, a number of um, medieval and Renaissance paintings. Joseph <clears throat> handing over his royal ancestry. Uh, and the staircase. Um, or the latter motif, that's also an important part of uh, medieval reflection on Joseph. Um, it goes back at least to the 11th, 12th century, uh, the theologian Rupert of Deutz, the German Benedictine theologian. Um, he regularly spoke about Joseph as standing on the top rung of the genealogical ladder. Uh, so here's a little example. Um, Born as a little child in this world, it's Christ, namely without a father in the flesh, the Lord made use of that blessed man, Joseph, as his father in every way. And in the genealogy, in that generation scala, in that staircase of generation, um, which Matthew follows out, he rested on St. Joseph as if on the top rung of a ladder for, he, for every need of his humanity. So Joseph, top of the ladder. And now in the Pierogi Cosimo painting, he comes down. Um, here's uh, a, a, a later example of a similar idea. It's a bit dark, um, particularly at the bottom. Um, but um, believe me when I say, uh, Joseph is in a rather awkward position because his left foot is on the pavement and his right foot is on the first of the series of steps. Mary has um, her left foot on the first step and her right foot on the step above. So this idea of steps and Joseph is lower down. He is the top of the ladder, uh, bringing, bestowing the divinity an ancestry on Jesus, and then he can hand him over to his mother. Okay, so none of these probably, I don't know, were, were images you're expecting to see in relation to the genealogy of Matthew. Um, uh, so you're not disappointed. Here are a couple of things that you might be expecting to see. Um, this is a snapshot of the uh, West Facade of Notre Dame in Paris. Um, these are 19th century restorations, these statues, but it uh, gives you an idea. Uh, this is just part of it. There are 28 kings of Judah here. That is the number of generations between David and Christ. So Matthew's genealogy is playing a significant role here, even if these kings of Judah are also there functioning as um, prefigurings of the French monarchy, so there's uh, other things going on there. 
Um, but from elsewhere in France, uh, the an example of the famous Jesse tree, um, very common, particularly in stained glass, uh, which clearly is not depicting the whole of the genealogy, but it is uh, a snapshot of the Mathean genealogy, um, uh, read in conjunction with the 11th chapter of the prophet Isaiah. Um, which is a reading that goes back to Tertullian. Um, so it's a very ancient Christian reading. Um, now, let's just explain that to you. So in the central uh, panels, at the bottom you have Jesse, the father of David, and this tree grows out of Jesse, um, uh, which is picking up on uh, Isaiah 11, 1, uh, and Egredi, uh, 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 and the rod shall come forth from the, rod, uh, the root of Jesse, and the flower shall ascend from his shoot. And so you have this tree growing out from Jesse, and then his son David is above him. Then we have Solomon. Then we have Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. Then we have Abijah. So we have... Uh, four kings who are mentioned in the genealogy in Matthew. And then we have Mary, and then we have Christ. Uh, and the reason for the presence of Mary is this uh, intertextual reading of, of Matthew in conjunction with Isaiah 11. Um, in the Latin, so in the, originally the old Latin that Tertullian knew, um, but then in the Vulgate, similarly, uh, the rod in Latin is viaga, um, and Tertullian recognized the resemblance between viaga and viago, virgin. So uh, the rod virgin shall come forth from the root of Jesse, and then the, the flower, the floss, is Christ. And so we have Mary and then Christ uh, above her. But the other interesting thing, which is not straightforwardly present in Matthew's genealogy are the presence of these prophets flanking the kings on either side. Um, now, not straightforwardly in Matthew's genealogy, <clears throat> but unstraightforwardly in Matthew's genealogy, um, because um, in the the second set, so the kings between David and the deportation to Babylon, in verse 10, Matthew reads, and Hezekiah was the father of Manasseh, and Manasseh the father of Amos. Not Ammon, as you would be expecting, but Amos, i.e. the name of a prophet. And so um, certainly later interpreters of Matthew thought, and this is what's happening here, the prophets had managed to squeeze their way into the royal line in the genealogy. Um, okay, so um, but the Jesse tree, um, because it climaxes not just with the child, um, but with his mother, uh, is a reminder that the genealogy in Matthew actually ends with the mention not of a father, but of a mother. Um, Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called the Messiah. Um, Mary, actually one of five mothers mentioned in a genealogy which is otherwise patrilineal, which is normal for Jewish genealogies, certainly biblical genealogies. It's, um, they're often uh, concerned with ancestry and then therefore go through the father. But of course, the striking thing in Matthew is that the mothers are not the expected mothers, Sarah, or Rebecca, or Rachel, um, but Tamar, and Rahab, and Ruth, and the wife of Uriah, and Mary. Well, I thought I'd show you this. This is not the women in the genealogy, um, 
But it is an interesting development, particularly in German art uh, uh, of the uh, late Middle Ages um, and into the early modern period, which is probably a reaction to the overemphasis on the men in the biblical genealogy, and particularly the way in which the Jesse tree often loses merit. So the women then completely disappear. And so we have this kind of alternative focus on the family tree, which focuses on the so-called holy kinship, which is St. Anne, the mother of Mary, her three daughters, three daughters by three different husbands. Um, she's widowed twice. Um, uh, and then uh, other, uh, the other sisters are uh, connected with other figures in the gospel story. So one of them is the mother of James and Joseph, the brothers of Jesus. And, um, uh, and then you have Salome, the mother of uh, James and John, the sons of Zebedee. She is also a sister. So it's, it's extended family. Uh, and then John the Baptist sometimes comes in to play with his cousins. Um, so it's a very interesting focus upon the significance of the female line um, and the, the, the husbands are then relegated to the back row in this. And this kind of juxtaposes with the Jesse tree, um, particularly in German art and uh, devotion. So this is uh, a wonderful example that is in the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., Okay, so um, commentaries on Matthew will often focus on the mothers um, and then try and see, well, um, what is the connection between them? Um, so one common explanation is that the, the, the mothers, uh, with the exception of Mary, are all Gentiles, or at least uh, described as if they were Gentiles. So Tamar is either a Canaanite or in some Jewish tradition, she's an Aramean. Uh, Rahab is a Canaanite. Um, <clears throat> Ruth uh, from Moab. Uh, and Bathsheba is the wife of the Hittite. So the emphasis, particularly those figures, those mothers who are instrumental in uh, ensuring the establishment of the Davidic monarchy. So the, the first, the last few generations before David. Um, uh, this idea that outsiders have made it possible for the uh, the the and then the, 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 the Israelite uh, king, uh, the united monarchy under David, to be established. So challenging some uh, views of uh, the purity of the race, particularly the purity of uh, the royal line a reminder that outsiders have been brought in in order to fulfill the will of God. The other explanation often given is that in the stories, there is often some um, suspicion uh, regarding their marital status, sometimes uh, uh, unfairly so, and so that would be then uh, a connection with the figure of Mary at the end of the genealogy. But the focus on the mothers often detracts from the rather disreputable fathers. Um, so, think of Jacob, a liar and a cheat. Think of Judah. Think of David. Or think of David and Uriah. Uh, think of those pretty disreputable kings of Judah, Rehoboam, Abijah, and Manasseh, um, uh, things that look particularly great from the perspective of the fathers. And I always find this quotation from Herbert McKay uh, really seen in Herbert McKay, if you don't know him, um, uh, such a, a, uh, an extraordinary figure, theologian, uh, philosopher, um, active in Oxford, uh, Blackfriars for, for many, many years. He wrote this, it's only like a four-page 
uh, talk on the genealogy. He's given us a talk. Um, but if you want to understand the genealogy, genealogy of Matthew, you've only got like 10 minutes, read her own day. And this is the climax of his discussion of the genealogy of Christ in Matthew. Well, that is the book of the generation of Jesus Christ. The moral is too obvious to labor. Jesus did not belong to the nice clean world of Angela McNamara or Mary Whitehouse. Um, apologies to uh, our American colleagues. These people may not be much to you. Um, or to the honest, reasonable, sincere world of the Observer or the Irish Times. He belonged to a family of murderers, cheats, cowards, adulterers, and liars. He belonged to us and came to help us. No wonder he came to a bad end and gave us some hope. Um, so, pay attention to the fathers, but then particularly pay attention to the breaks in the rhythm in the genealogy. So it's not just the mention of the mothers, or that the mothers are important, it's when that rather monotonous A was the father of B, A begat B, B begat C, begins to break down. Because there, where the rhythm breaks down, something significant is being said. So Abraham was the father of Isaac and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. What happened at that generation? That is when the nation was established. These are the 12 tribes. Um, although one might also remember Judah, um, the one whose idea it was to sell his brother Joseph into slavery for 20 pieces of silver. Um, so that the, the, the establishment of uh, the nation uh, then it goes on and Judah didn't go very far and Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar. So then the first of these outsiders um, uh, from whom the King David will be uh, descended. Salmon was the father of Boaz by Rahab. Rahab, uh, the, the prostitute from uh, Jericho. Uh, Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth. Um, this uh, figure from Moab who cleaves to her mother in law, refuses to go back. You know, wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Uh, and then uh, over the father of Jesse, and Jesse was the father of David, of a king. So then the Davidic monarchy is uh, highlighted here. David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah, and so then uh, Bathsheba uh, mentioned there. Then it goes on, on, all the way down to the end of the second set of 14 generations, and Josiah was the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. So, and his brothers marking both the establishment of the nation and also the trauma of war, uh, destruction and exile to Babylon. And then uh, right at the end of the third set the great break in the rhythm and Jacob was the father of Joseph and expecting and Joseph was the father of so Jacob was the father of Joseph the husband of Mary of whom Jesus was born who is called the Messiah okay so we're back with Piero di Cosimo um, and Joseph descending from the top of the staircase. Now, there are all kinds of other things going on in this painting um, that I haven't had time to explore, uh, <clears throat> some of which I don't yet understand, so I hope some of you might be able to shed some light. Um, uh, but the figure of, of, of Christ, the object of devotion uh, right at the front, um, the wheat, Pillow was the symbol of the Eucharist. Uh, there is a, a little uh, rose there, um, probably here in relation to Isaiah 11. Um, Christ has the rose, sorry, the flower that comes from uh, the, uh, the stock of Jesse. Um, 
you've got John the Baptist, the infant John the Baptist, but he already has his cross-like staff. He is already fulfilling his role as the, uh, uh, the, the, the one who bears witness. Behold the Lamb of God who takes a little sin of the world. Uh, Johannine passage there being evoked by his clothing uh, and his stuff. He is already in the wilderness. Um, then you have behind uh, the ox and the ass. Um, so those two figures um, who find their way into nativity scenes from uh, relatively early age, probably on the basis of the opening chapter of the prophet Isaiah, because of course uh, neither Matthew nor Luke will refer to donkey uh, or uh, an ass. Um, so the ox knows its owner and the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know my people do not understand. But also, of course, the ox is the symbol of St. Luke traditionally, and so um, in nativity scenes uh, where um, this one is a bit mixed, but uh, many of them are obviously dependent upon Luke to uh, a strong uh, degree. Uh, and so the ox is also functioning as a symbol of Luke, the evangelist. Uh, but then this is also influenced by Matthew, so you can just about make up the Magi um, heading towards the ruined hut of the house of David uh, in the distance. Um, but what I wanted to finish with, really, is the top of the staircase. Um, so Joseph is at the top and he's coming down, except that there is another staircase and it's going up. It's going up beyond the roof of the house. Um, and there are angels hovering round. Um, so at least two things seem to be going on here. The first, of course, is that the Davidic line has been built up again. So Joseph has reached the top, he has handed Christ over, given him his Davidic descent, and uh, the crumbling house is now being uh, restored. Um, obviously, um, the full restoration depends on the rest of the story, and he might notice to the left at the top there is a bird's nest, which somewhat resembles a crown of thorns. Um, but then there's this other staircase which is going up and the presence of angels. Um, as if heaven has also descended to the, um, the presence of angels, um, this piercing of the veil between heaven and earth is one of the points at which Matthew's infancy narrative intersects with Luke's. There aren't too many points of contact, but that is one of them. And this, I guess, is a gentle plug for next week. Not that you have to come back, but if you do, um, we'll be thinking about uh, Luke's infancy narrative. Uh, if Matthew begins with establishing the royal lineage of the Messiah, the line of David, uh, Luke will take us out to the margins. Luke will take us to the Annunciation, of the Saviour's birth to a group of shepherds. Um, and what that shift from regal to pastoral milieu looks like, um, well, we'll have to wait until next week. Um, uh, and particularly how that is visualized through the brush and the eyes of Nicolas Poussin. Um, so, if you're interested in that, come back next week. Um, if not, uh, it's been wonderful seeing you. Um, but now uh, we've got about 15 minutes um, uh, for questions. So um, feel free to uh, ask a question. There was a question in the chat which has just kind of disappeared. I think it was to do with the rock and the skull. Um, quite possibly. Um, I think, you know, that given that there are all kinds of uh, um, symbols of the passion 
and uh, other theological motifs uh, at play here. It is, it is and, and certainly that, that crown of thorns like bird nest is pointing to the passion. So, um, uh, and then John the Baptist as well, behold the Lamb of God, uh, I think it's quite likely that uh, other symbols of the passion are being displayed here. Any other questions or observations? Or any, any images you want to go back and look at in more detail? Mm. No, thank you, thank you so much, Ian. I I got curious on 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 the on the dress of the Virgin Mary being in red color, uh, and and the angels. But you know, if it's anything, uh, yeah. So, um, uh, I mean, <laughs> she is often depicted in in. Uh, Rich colors, so often purple. Um, and yeah. So I think you know the, the, the most expensive colors that an artist could produce. Um, so you know, obviously the blue is particularly associated with her, but she is often wearing uh, multi-color outfits. Um, the striking thing for me, I hadn't noticed until now, and I've been looking at it the whole evening, um, is that she's also got green uh, as well as blue. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Which is which is striking. That then connects her to the angel who is dressed in green. Um, mm -hmm. It's kind of a tie between those two figures, but obviously uh, uh, relative importance is expressed by size and the angel is clearly less important than Mary because the angel is smaller. Um, but there is this visual tie between the two of them uh, in the color of their, of their garments. Yeah. Um, but I, but I don't know why the what particular significance there of the green would be. If anyone else, well, yeah, knows. that's also interesting. The green is interesting in both. Yeah. And interesting that Mary and the angels swapped the color scheme. She's got mainly red, okay. and yes. mainly green with red sleeves, and then sort of a dull blue. Yeah, I mean, the vivid green is often associated with the Garden of Eden. Um, so you have this lush green grass, whether there's something there about the, the, the restoration. Um, so, uh, okay, yeah, question about the, the upward staircase. Uh, so, um, you know, when you look at the, the painting, first of all, you, you think, well, you know, Joseph's reached the top, um, and then um, you know, it takes a while for you to notice that there is another level, um, but it seems to reach beyond the roof or what would be the roof of this rather crumbling house of David. Um, uh, but those who are closest to it are angels. So it looks at the, 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 the first level is the, that's the genealogy, that's the division line going up to the top where Joseph is. On the, well, on the penultimate step was coming down from that. Um, but then you've got another staircase coming down. So this juxtaposition of um, earthly ancestry and heavenly descent. So the angels are close to the foot of the upper staircase. Um, so of course you can't see heaven because we're at the top of the, the tondo. Um, but it's implied by the presence of the, the angels and the clouds there. So, yeah, I mean, it looks to me as if that it's those two movements coming together, the descent uh, and the ascent, the ascent of the genealogy, the, the descent of the angels. Well, what do we make of the figure standing looking towards the descending angels? You know, the close-up of that top bit, which yes, um, um, that's such a wonderful picture of Herbert. Isn't it? Yeah. I had to find one which wasn't copyrighted. So it's a it's a cover from a from a, a, a reader. So the character standing there. He's another angel. So those are wings? Yeah. So they are? Yeah. 
Um, so presumably it's the angel of the dream. Um, and then there are a couple more. Um, and do angels stand you wear that color? Um, since we're thinking about they, well, they wear all kinds of color. I mean, I'm thinking, so this is round about the time that Botticelli painted his mystic nativity. Uh, and the angels there are wearing all kinds of colorful outfits. Um, and so they're in Florence at exactly the same time. They're probably both influenced by Sam and Roma. Um, talking about the Vengeance. Um, so, uh, yeah, in fact, we have um, those of you who are in, in situ here, we have a reproduction of the Mystic Nativity just outside the dining room. They go and check start afterwards, but my memory is that they're, you know, they're wearing very, very different uh, a different colored outfit, um, and the their wings are also very. I mean, a lot of them have peacock feather wings. That's that's very very common in Italian art in, in this period, and in in uh, uh, Flemish art as well, and. Piero de Cosimo was influenced by uh, Netherlandish art. There were strong connections between uh, Flemish art, there were strong connections between Florence and Bruges, for example. So, yeah, so whether the other angels are a kind of nod in the direction of Luke, where you have uh, the choirs of angels as well as the, the, the angelic mediator. Um, I would think that you know, this is playing out from the theater narrative. Um, so, you know, he's told in a dream, the first dream is to take Mary as your wife and name the child. Um, and so, uh, you know, he's, he's done that obediently. Um, but yes, I think probably that that's the Lithian angel. That, What we can't see is whether he's got his eyes shut. Um, because, of course, you know, Joseph, the dreamer, he's regularly depicted as asleep, even when he's apparently alert. You know, nativity scenes, he's often his head drooped and his eyes shut as if he's still dreaming. Um, I can't see whether he's got his eyes open there. Okay. Maybe what we said at the beginning um, was this intended for a church or private use? Or? So these tondos seem to have been either for private devotion or for some of them were displayed in like town halls, mm -hmm. municipal buildings like that. Um, <clears throat> I did read something, I don't know how reliable it is, that the origins of these tontos was as uh, gifts for uh, uh, after a, a saint delivering the child. Um, so before they became uh, objects of devotion, um, they were given to obviously a wealthy person who uh, had just given birth. And so they often depicted scenes of births and and the ultimate birth was the birth of Christ. And so um, uh, that may be an explanation of to why these begin to emerge, but they, by the time of Pierre and Cosmo, they, they seem to be regularly displayed in public buildings, or if you were wealthy enough, you might have one in your private chapel. Um, and we will see um, later in the series um, another uh, Tondo, which is by um, Ferrara Angelico, completed by Fra Filippo Lippi, um, which again is in Washington, um, of the uh, Adoration of the Major. Okay, that's very, very cool. So, would this artist have known that painting? Uh, good question. 
I'm not sure. I'd have to. I've got this but I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Good. yeah. I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the, the earlier. Um, but I'm not sure where it was. So whether it would have been seen by a pure. Um, but I can. Could be it? Hmm? I can guess if that works. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I want to. Um, someone in Washington might know. Um, I wonder if Nancy, do you know Nancy? I oh, we can look anyway. Um, I can see, see, see the light in the photos. Okay, well, if there are no further questions. Thank you uh, for coming. Thank you for those of you who have come a long, long way um, virtually um, and uh, nice to see some Thank you. familiar faces. Um, nice to see you Paul um, and uh, look forward to um, seeing some of you hopefully next time um, when we will look at Luke's Nativity uh, particularly through the lens of uh, Nicolas Poussin. Um, have a good evening for some of you, have a good afternoon for others of you, uh, and hopefully see you next week. Yeah. Thank you.